Well, welcome to 383 Hampton Road and Kennebecasis Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here today. As a church, we have a mission of growing community by loving, following, and sharing Jesus. And always on our heart are four key values. The key values that we really state over and over again is the idea of worship, the idea of missions, the idea of the next generation, and the idea of connecting with each other and connecting with Jesus. So over the next four weeks, what we're going to begin to do is really dissect each one of those values. A value is so key and important for defining a church particularly because there's so many different viewpoints. And so when we really stick to the idea of these four values, we really gain a, a feel for what it's like to be part of Kennebecasis Baptist Church. And speaking of which, if you have a desire within your heart and you've been baptized and you desire to be part of the church membership... Uh, you have an opportunity after the service today to connect with Kristen or I, and we'll talk you through about some of the steps it will require to, uh, to join membership. Membership is not a huge thing here at our church for, um, for anything other than feeling like you're part of the community. And so for us, these four values draw us into community. Today we're going to be talking about worship. And we might define worship of what just occurred up here on stage, or we may define worship in different ways. We'll decide individually today how you particularly worship the God that we particularly celebrated last week during Easter season and the Holy Week. So for worship at Kennebecasis Baptist Church, it comes down to two key values. These are the values we hold to. The first is this. It's about what God desires, not what we want. We'll get a little bit more into that today. And another, it's about every day, not just Sunday. We can get trapped into a loophole of two things. I want the worship I want, and I want to do it on Sunday at 10. Those are two things that would go against the values of us as a church. Because really for us, it's about what God desires, not what we want. Growing up, I spent a lot of time in an Anglican church. My family background is Anglican. We went to Anglican churches as much as possible. My dad uh, was a military uh, uh, sergeant in the Air Force, and we attended a Protestant church on bases both in Cold Lake, Alberta, we attended one in uh, Baden in Germany, and we also attended one in Greenwood, Nova Scotia. That's actually where I began to decide for myself what worship looked like. And unfortunately, it went in a wrong direction, because my experience of worship didn't lead me closer to Jesus. And in the end, it led me further away from Jesus. My experience of worship was not healthy for me, particularly my relationship with Jesus. And so I lost relationship with Jesus because I had a misinterpretation of what worship was supposed to be. From the age of 16 to 20, I lived a life where there was no God. I lived a life as an atheist or an agnostic, believing that there was nothing beyond this life that we know. The age of 19, going on 20, I came to understand who Jesus was through an evangelism conference in Woodstock, New Brunswick. In little old Woodstock, New Brunswick, Brian Stockford came to know who Jesus was and what worship was started from that point on for me. The day after I came to know Jesus, there was a concert in the same venue I came to know Jesus. And as I witnessed worship for the first time through song, I was amazed that people were singing the lyrics. Like, how do they remember these lyrics? Like, how many times have they sung these songs? Because I'm going back to the days now of of the 90s where now I'm listening to the alternative type of grunge music and I'm struggling remembering the lyrics because most people say, I don't even know what they're singing. 
in that type of music. And so I'm witnessing teenagers particularly singing these songs. I'm like, how do they remember these songs? Well, don't you know who this band is? I'm like, no, I have no idea who these guys are. They said, it's it's the Newsboys. I'm like, who? And, And it's third day. I'm like, who? Right? And so for me, worship began at that place, began to realize that there's a certain sense of what it feels like to have an understanding of worship. The first time I showed up in a Baptist church, there were drums. And I thought to myself, these must be rented just for Easter. <laughs> Who would allow drums in a church or an electric guitar for that matter? And I've also talked to some people who have visited church, particularly this church, and they find music and singing to be a little bit weird. And I must admit, there's a certain aspect, if you think culturally, of people standing in a place like this and singing songs to the culture. If it's not Taylor Swift, that sounds really weird. And then for some of us, it really comes down to the style of worship that draws us in. A lot of us are drawn to the traditional type of worship music, the hymns, the choruses, the organ. That's the style of worship that we want, which leads us away from what God is really desiring. Then there's the gospel music scene, the contemporary music scene, and church splits have been caused over the type of music that we sing. Here at KBC, we've really drawn towards this value. It's about what God desires, not what we want. If it was what we'd want, I'd be singing integrity music songs from the 90s, the the place where I came to know Jesus the rest of my life. Kind of. You know, what music do you want on Sunday morning is not a question that we have at KBC. It's what do you believe God desires from you? The music we sing is not worship. Pause for a second. Because you may be thinking, no, no, that's worship. No, it's not the songs that we sing that's worship. It's the heart that we bring to God. I partly agree that what we do on Sunday mornings is worship. The music we play and sing is not necessarily the worship, but it's what draws us to A worship song is not only a worship song, or a worship song is only a worship song if it does one thing, draws us to worship, which is what, in the end, God desires. Let's talk about that one thing. It's about what God desires, not what we want. Can you go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 4? John chapter 4 for me. If you're new here at KBC, there are some... Bibles that are sitting in front of you in some of the pews, you can feel free to open those up. If you don't have a Bible at home, feel free to take it home. John chapter 4 is a story about a woman going to get some water. Now this woman that's going to get some water doesn't have a whole lot of friends. She's lived a lifestyle that would have drawn her away from a community of people. She feels like she's the low of the low now at this point. Not only that, but the type of person she is, men shouldn't be hanging out with her, particularly Jesus. But Jesus, sitting alone at the well, greets this woman. And he greets her and has a conversation with her, draws her to understand who he is. And he draws her to understand what worship is. John chapter 4, verse twenty. After this conversation about worship, Jesus is led to say these, one, these, these two, these key words. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers worship in spirit and truth. We're about 90 days away from Bolivia. I'm heading there with uh, nine people that um, were, were gaining a growth and understanding uh, certain things about each other, and then also working through our Duolingo 
Duolingo being the app that's on our phones that's helping us understand Spanish and, you know, things like Mi Nombre es Brian, uh, Tango in Pero, Es Nombre es Caesar. Um, anybody know what I just said? I have a dog named Caesar. I have a dog named Caesar. And what I love about Caesar, Caesar I've had plenty of dogs. Caesar uh, is my dog. This, like, we've had dogs that are my wife's dogs, the kids' dogs. Caesar is my dog. And he knows it. Ever since I met Caesar, Caesar and I have had a bond. Reading the other day that dogs or pets have a, an ability to increase the serotonin level of their masters. When, when we actually make eye contact with our pets, our serotonin levels can increase. That, of course, is unless they've done something wrong, which decreases it. But most times, a 90% scale, that our dogs increase our serotonin levels, or our pets, our cats, or whatever. We also have a pet turtle, which doesn't really increase my serotonin level, so I don't get it a whole lot. But for Caesar, he does. There's a little bit of an increase that happens. Every morning, I wake up to go get my coffee. Here's the coffee maker. He runs upstairs, and he sits at my feet, and I pet him. And it just, there's this bond that happens. And I let him outside, and he, he enjoys the outdoors. But Caesar and I have a great relationship. And what I appreciate about Caesar is that he knows how to worship me. Now, I, I, I know what you're thinking in this moment, but there's an ability for Caesar to just act like I am the person. I am the one that he looks to in every moment. I'm the one that when he wakes up, he looks forward to hanging out with. I'm the one that, that he runs to when I show up. And I often wonder, what would my relationship with God look like if it was the same as Caesar and me? That every morning I woke up and I ran to my master in prayer, in reading, and listening to worship music? What if every time my, my master showed up, I would run to his feet? What if every time my master said, hey, do you want to go for a walk with me? I would run, and I would wait for that opportunity to hang out with him. The Greek word we use for worship, one of them is proskuneo. Proskuneo comes from this idea of pros, which is to look toward, and kaneo, which is a verb derived from the root word kion, which means dog, interestingly enough. It's this idea of bowing down, like a dog would, like Caesar does every morning. It's this idea that I think we have to grasp when it comes to worship. Now I have a little bit of a struggle also as a human being because I have a level of greed in my life. I don't want to look to masters. I want to live life like I'm independent, that I don't need anybody. And also, I struggle with this idea, this concept that there's a creator that's requiring me in a selfish way to worship him. So I need to transfer my mind away from that human thinking about God. Because what God desires is not that we create a master-God relationship with him, but a relationship that really comes back to, well, well, let's look into it a little bit, the idea of worship. Worship in the Hebrew comes from this word shakah. Shakah, um, you might hear that word sometimes, even particularly in this season, every morning. Like, questions I have, like, what are a crow's favorite game? Would it be croquet? Or what do crows like to drink to stay awake? Coffee. Coffee. Well, why was the crow on the telephone wire? To make a long distance call. Hey, good job, everybody. <laughs> or where do teenagers go after high school? 
College, yeah. I know, I know. And what about, you know, what are, what's a crow's favorite vegetable? Call. You guys are catching on. You're catching on. And who were the crows trying to get away from after they stole something? The cops. Yes, yes. Shaka is something that every morning, if you listen to a crow, they're creating this sense of, well, what we need to do in our lives. Shaka. From the very beginning of Scripture, Shaka has been a word that has led people to understand who God is. Back in the day of Abraham, a forefather in the Old Testament, Abraham was going up onto a mountain to do something that he thought was worship, to sacrifice his son Isaac. Back in the day, and this is crazy about, you know, way back in the day, sacrificing your children was a common thing when it came to worshiping God. We couldn't imagine that today. Obviously, we couldn't imagine that today. Not even a figment of my imagination could imagine that today. But the Hebrews and those around them thought that it was natural for God to desire the sacrifice, particularly of the firstborn child. So when it came time where Abraham thought, okay, it's time to worship God, He took Isaac, his son, up onto a mountain. And he says to the people he's leaving behind, saying, it's just me and Isaac going up. We're going to go climb the mountain to sacrifice, to worship. God, of course, at that point, says, no, that's not what I desire. You may have thought that's what you desire, but I'm going to provide another sacrifice instead of Isaac. And from this point on, you're going to begin to realize that worship is not about sacrificing your firstborn son. Worship is when I provide something for you to worship through. Abraham did not have to sacrifice Isaac in worship. Later on, we see the word again, shakah, when Abraham's servants finding a wife for Isaac. And he shakahs. And the word shakah is really about bowing down. He goes to another place to bow down. Joseph, when his dad Jacob was about to pass, he worships and he bows down to God. Moses and Aaron, when Exodus story was about to begin, they shakah. And then Moses, when he receives the Ten Commandments, shakahs, this idea of shakahing is bowing down. Let's go back to Caesar as my dog. When I say, Caesar, let's go for a walk, he comes and shakahs. He bows down and says, yes, let's do this. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14 says, do not worship any other gods. Don't bow down, don't shakad any other gods whose name or, or anything else because my name, God, is a jealous and I am a jealous God. Judges chapter 2, verse 10. This is the next time we begin to see this word uh, again because this idea of shakahing about bowing down is something that's now enculturated I don't know exactly what it looks like to fully bow down back in the Hebrew days, but I want to decide what shaka is for me. What is it like for me to bow down to my master? Judges chapter 2, verse 10. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed, when we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. The Lord your God is a God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of your fathers, mothers, and my brothers. Um, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives. The men assured, if you don't tell what... Am I reading the right verse? No, I'm not at all. Okay, I'm reading Joshua. Oh my goodness, that's crazy, people. Okay, I always have to ask for forgiveness once a month. And this is the one. Judges chapter 2, not Joshua. Joshua, Judges chapter, I was, okay, 
Verse 10. After the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up. So here's the conversation. Who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel? Then Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord and the, and the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods and peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. Asherahs. In his anger against the Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges, check this out, who saved them out of the hands of their raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies. As long as the judge lived, for the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under their own, those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping or shakaying them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. This word, shaka, is like a roller coaster of some mindsets. Even in our own lives, we begin to see one day I can be really... Uh, focused on God, the next day I can lose focus. And then there's weeks that I totally lose focus. Months, is, months where I don't even think about God. And then there's times where I really draw near to Him. There's certain things in my life that draw me closer to God, and there's certain things in my life that draw me further away from God. In this situation here, you see the roller coaster effect. Judges brought them closer to God, and then they drew further away. You know what I'm talking about in your own life. We've been talking about the idea in, in Scripture that the Hebrew Bible is the original language. And then to create a little bit more of a Roman-centric or Greek-centric, they, they created an LXX, a Septuagint. The Septuagint is what Jesus primarily might have looked to or the Scripture writers might have looked to to, to translate some of the language. We get the word proskuneo from the word shaka. The word, Greek word proskuneo appears numerous times in the New Testament. It's often translated to worship or to bow down. Like the wise men showing up at Jesus' birth or when he was a toddler would have bowed down to Jesus. Jesus in the wilderness, when he's, he's confronted with Satan, he basically says, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord, or bow down to the Lord your God, and serve him only. Here Jesus is quoting Old Testament and emphasizing the importance of worshiping God alone. And then the disciples on the boat, when Jesus shows up and calms the storm, they worship or bow down to Jesus. And our verse of the day, John chapter 4, verse 23, yet a time is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. This is the word proskuneo, this idea of bowing down. These examples illustrate how proskuneo is used in the New Testament to convey acts of worship and homage, particularly directed towards Jesus. But there are other Hebrew words that we need to understand that are also translated into worship in the English. There's actually three words. The word shaka. There's also a word yare. Yare is another word that's particularly uh, translated into worship. And we see this in 2 Kings verse 17. In this, we see this word that is translated into the Greek, phobiomai, which is yare in Hebrew, translated to phobiomai. You might recognize phobiomai a little bit. We start with phobia, which would be a fear. The idea of fear, when it comes to these, is to be afraid, 
This Greek word captures the sense of reverence, awe, or fear that the Hebrew word yare conveys. Acts chapter 10, verse 2. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. You hear that word a lot, God-fearing. This is the phobio, my understanding, God-fearing. Or to be cautious, circumspect. By faith, Noah, when warned about things yet to come, in holy fear, built an ark. In the Hebrew, it's yare. In English, it's worship. Again, the same English word that we have for shakah, yare, is also translated into worship. It's an idea of fear. And then the last one is abad. Abad, or even uh, uh, the idea of, oh, here we go, Moses in the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. Abad, the Hebrew word, is also translated into worship. The Hebrew word abad is duleo in the Septuagint, or the idea of serving, or to be uh, uh, an attitude of servitude. The Greek word carries the idea of serving someone or something. Being a position of servitude or performing duties. And we see this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, 24, where Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. This word serve is this translated from Greek, from Hebrew, from this word, well, abad, translated into worship in English. Follow me. Three words in Hebrew translated into one word, worship. In English, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, or leads, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to forgiveness. This idea of slaves comes from this word, duoleo. And then Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not... Use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another in humble love. Worship. So worship really comes down to three words. To bow down, to fear, and to serve. Interesting when you begin to think of it. Shaka, yare, or avad. In summary, while all three words can be related to religious or spiritual context, they convey different aspects of worship. So when you feel that that worship didn't affect me today, or I didn't feel like I was in a worshipful mood, there's different ideas, attitudes, and personalities when it comes to worship. For some of us, music isn't the draw to worship. For some of us, serving is our draw to worship. For some of us, just having a fear or a sense of what God can do in this world is worship. It's what you fear, what you serve, and what you bow down to. Anything that gets in the way of this is preventing you from worshiping God. Tomorrow around 3.30. I think something's happening. Anybody hear anything on the news lately? Anybody buy some glasses? No, but you know what? I was, I was at the Canadian Tire yesterday. I noticed they had a whole bin of them. So they're available. Uh, great suggestion. Uh, some won't adhere. To, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know what percentage. What percentage of people do you think will stare directly into the sun without any form of glasses at all? We are stupid people. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, and I'm thinking to myself, how many will be going to the eye doctor the next week? Because I guess it takes a little while for the effects time. And, and, and like, I'm guessing in a week, the, these people are just going to be inundated with phone calls saying, I, I need to get in. We are stupid people. The, the exposure to the light, I guess, can cause damage and destroy cells of the retina. But for some reason, we're going to stare directly into it. And I think about one of the questions that, what about animals? Well, the question is, will, will animals not be susceptible? Because they're not, I can just picture now, I saw a dog with these glasses on the other day, right? I'm like, 
dogs will think, this is stupid, because you know what? The natural instinct of a dog or any animal is not to look at the sun in the first place anyways. We're the only stupid animals to do it, to actually think about it. Animals actually don't even think about it at all. They, they, they just live life knowing that the sun is there, but they don't have to stare at it. They just recognize it's there. They just recognize that it's providing warmth, providing light, and providing all necessities of life. Animals know that. Humans don't. Humans are looking for evidence. And sometimes that reflects on the God that we are supposed to worship. He doesn't exist, right? Right? Like, you think of our culture today that are self-sufficient and, and have no idea what worship is because they have no idea what God is. They've been looking for him, but they haven't found him. They celebrate Christmas and Easter in some aspects, but they're still looking for the sun. And because they can't see, feel, touch, or any of that, they don't believe him. And they have nothing to worship but themselves or their things. Again, the, wash, worship, the opposite of worship is this. Anything that gets away in the way of the sun, it's like an eclipse. And I believe, and we talked about this, if I guess you drive up to Grand Lake this, on Monday, you get 100%. Here we're 99%. I believe in our culture today, we are almost at a 100% eclipse of who God is in North America. I believe that, that somehow the darkness has allowed itself into a place where we have no idea what it's like to worship God. The opposite of worship is something getting in the way of the Son. His name is Jesus. And there's distractions in life. Atheists would say these words, there is no God. There's nothing to worship but the things I discover I want to worship. Agnostics believe that there might be a God, but because I'm not certain, I'm going to worship whatever I want to worship. Humanists have removed God altogether. Things like pornography has said sex is God. That's what I'll bow down to. Greed has said money is God. Pride has said I am God. Government says power is God. And the Bible says Jesus is God. There's a lot of opinions about who God is, but only one truth. Stick to the Bible, and you will know what to worship. Now the question is, how do you worship? And I want to say it this way. You worship the way that draws you closest to Jesus. Because ultimately that's what God desires. God desires us to worship him the way that we draw closest to him. For some of us it's serving. For some of us it's praise. And for some of us it's just living life like he exists. We are not worshiping anything other than the creator of the earth. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Well, going back to verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, and that's so important. Everybody in this room has witnessed God's mercy. And Paul's asking us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Just give your life to him. That's worship. That's what God desires. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God's will is for your life, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I'll close off with these thoughts. We are not worshiping when we are not worshiping. What I mean by that is we need to find that time where we just, like a dog, run after his master. When the master says, hey, you want to go for a walk? Caesar's right there. And I love that as a, as, a, as a human being, that there is a dog that wants to do that in my life, more or less that there's somebody that wants to hang out with me. I worship when I sing praises to Jesus. And that causes me to bow down. Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, 
is saying there's more important things in life than sleeping in. There's more important things in life than going and doing things that I want to do. In the end, worshiping just says this one time slot is my public opportunity to say I'm bowing down to Jesus. Or when I serve, like at Camp Tlachitic, mark your calendars, April 19th and 20th. It's a Friday and Saturday. We have an opportunity to go out and serve and worship God through serving. And we might not even sing one song, but we're worshiping through serving Jesus at Camp Tlachitic. Or work day, or, or that day, or how about KVHS next Monday? Nadine and a group of people are going to be serving over at KVHS. We're going over there for 3.30, and we're going to be serving the teacher's supper as they prepare for parent-teacher that day. We'll be serving, and we'll be worshiping. And then another way is through communion. Communion is, as we've talked about, our opportunity to come into worship. And I want to prepare our hearts now for this opportunity. I want to invite the worship team up, and we'll begin to worship Christ through communion. This is a, also one of the three, the idea of fearing God. Because there was an opportunity for God to say, you know what, I'm going to make, hold every single person accountable to the sin. And that created fear. But Jesus unleashed the power of grace through the cross. Because when I live life without fear, I live on the resurrection side of the cross. This is the first Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. And often our, our default is to go back to the Good Friday side of the cross as human beings. What I mean by the Good Friday side of the cross is the side that I still have to do everything to please God. That's the Good Friday side of the cross. And I would say in North America, most people live on the Good Friday side of the cross. And that's not healthy because there's a resurrection side of the cross which we live on today. And when you worship on the resurrection side of the cross, you do not see God as a self-serving master. You do not see God as one who requires worship. You see God as one who desires you to be in relationship with him. Because in relationship with him, life goes better. The resurrection side of the cross we are brought back to the sacrifice through communion. We're reminded of Good Friday every month, the first Sunday, and this is how we worship. But then we go from this place to the resurrection side of the cross. And I think that's where I want to find myself in worship. And that's how I want to see Jesus. I want to worship Jesus because I want to worship Jesus. And this is a chance for us to do this.